Mate, we are finally able to do one of these behind the scenes kind of chats. Um, you and I, some people may not know, have quite a history of gigging in bands together way yeah. before Sing It Live was even a thing. So it's nice to be able to finally do it. When we're there in the room, usually we're quickly like, hey, hey. Oh, it's such a rush. Yeah. 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 Oh, but, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> hey. I'm talking now. I've got to. Tune this guitar and tune the mandolin and... Yeah, so thanks for your time, mate. And so, yeah, so we'll talk about the Rod Stewart song. Before we do, though, tell all of the wonderful viewers, who is Tib and uh, how did he get into this crazy thing? Sing it live or just generally? <laughs> all of the above. Yeah, so it's Tib, short for Tibor. The reason I mention it is because people get so confused with my name because they say, oh, I'm Tib. They're hi, Tim. So I kind of actually explain, no, it's not... Tim, it's Tib. Um, it's originated because my my mother was Spanish and my father was Hungarian, and they met in France, and that's where they had myself and my sister. Yeah. So in Hungary, Tibor is like John. You know, it's like every you know, good day, John, yeah, Pete, whatever. But here, it's very rare. So yeah, just clearing up the name thing. Um, but yeah, look, I've I've been playing since I left school. <clears throat> I basically left school early uh, after year eleven to play rock and roll. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is great. You know, I was really sporty. Um, I used to play soccer um, for the state and all that sort of thing. Um, and I was really into that and tennis in the summertime. But then I kind of discovered music. So, you know, while the other kids at school were, were smoking on the oval and causing mischief, I was in the music room jamming um, with a mate of mine. Um, I was actually a drummer. That's when I discovered my love for music. I thought, wow, this is incredible the way this makes me feel. And, you know, and started writing these crappy little songs and, and all that sort of stuff. You know, I mean, I was, what, 16, 17? Not even really, probably 15. Um, yeah, and that's how it all started. And then when I discovered that, um, you know, you could actually do this and get paid and and, and do gigs and, and that sort of thing, that's when the sport sort of a little bit got left behind a little bit. And instead of playing soccer on a Saturday, I was kind of setting up for a gig. You know, this, this is better. Um, although I still am, you know, into the fitness and the bodybuilding and all that sort of stuff. And since then, it's just been nonstop writing, playing different bands, different projects. You know, uh, people might think that I just do covers and I'm sort of put in that little pocket. But, you know, I grew up actually doing originals um, in different original bands. I've had three publishing deals, you know, had the big management deal and all that sort of stuff and, you know, promised this and that. And this was before the internet. So this is the days of the big boss with the cigar and the sitting, oh, I go, boys, I'm going to make you a star, you know. Uh, that particular band didn't work out because grunge sort of came in and, and took over the world. Um, so if I remember correctly, that was... Lost that was Lost Angels. Lost Angels. Yeah. yeah. We were a few years, probably three years too late with what we were doing at the time in Sydney. Um, this was early 90s um, because it was very much kind of that 80s Guns N' Roses rock kind of um, sort of stuff. And um, it was a very good band, but I think it was just the the management left it too late to release the album and and, you know, all that sort of stuff. And it just got... It got lost in the shadows of grunge. <laughs> I remember you were telling me about that back in the day. We were backstage at some gig somewhere and you were telling me about it. And I remember thinking, wow, like that's such a good example of how important timing is. Oh, yeah. timing is everything. Mm. Timing is absolutely everything. Bands like Savage Garden are, are a fantastic um, example of that. You know, they came along with the right material at the right time with the right manager and released it just in that, you know, frame, the time frame where that, you know, would take off and it did. So, yeah, it is everything. But, yeah, I mean, since then, you know, I was in Sydney after that band just playing covers for a living. Um, I think I've played every single pub, club and RSL in New South Wales, I think, and beyond. Um, but that was fun. As, as you know, being a professional musician, you've got to do what you've got to do and, and, and pay the bills and stuff. And um, you learn a lot, though. People sort of knock covers, but 
you know, you learn a lot from from doing other people's songs because you go, oh wow, how did he do that? And and you know, how did he phrase that? And how does how does that you know the high palate um, nasally sound come out of him? And and you know, and so you kind of learn from other people, and then you obviously establish your own um, style, you know, which is very important. So um, yeah. So you and I met. Wow, it would have been ten years ago now, I guess. And then we we had a good five year run being in a band called The Gate Crashes, yep. which was um, really good experience in so many different ways. You know, we really uh, we really slogged it out, and and um, the best memories that I've got of being in that particular band is that we all sort of brought something. Yeah, to that band, and for you in particular, I mean, um, I sort of forgot about our similarities actually because I was a sporty guy as a kid, and then yeah. it kind of yeah. took over the sport thing, so I forgot that connection. But you and I had this connection where you know we're both happy to just kind of sort of chase our tail a bit as long as it's for the greater good. You know, like I, I remember our drummer, Paul, otherwise known as Animal, would say, he's like, I don't know too many other guys that would take a day off work just so that the band can get a rehearsal in. Hmm. And you would describe yourself as, uh, oh, I've just got OCD because of the way that I've labelled all of my cables and all of this. But I, <laughs> I, I remember thinking, well... I wouldn't be talking down about that. That's like, it's such a good attribute to have. There's so few musos that are out there that take such pride in being so organized. And you're one of them. And Darren is another guy that's just, yeah. it's no fluke that Sing It Live has done such a really good thing. And you're out there kicking goals because you've got a bunch of other things, which I guess we'll talk about as well. But, um, but so I guess what my ramble is leading to is that there's certain attributes that you had to have really to be able to, you know, survive in this game. And that's one thing that I see in you that mm. you're really organized and really motivated and, and that you get shit done. And so do you see yourself like that in comparison to other people? And also what else do you think that you have that's, you know, quite important and so forth? Yeah, look, I totally agree. Um, you know, I hate a messy studio or a messy workplace. Or um, one of my pet hates is those guys who um, don't cut off their guitar strings off on the on the neck and they roll them up. <laughs> I feel like strangling them. Why? Why have you got a messy, you know, guitar headstock? It just looks terrible, and it's just so you know you could poke yourself in the eye. Or yeah, so that sort of thing. I'm I'm really I've always been very organized you know like i i won't just write something my name with a text so i'll get a label maker and I'll, I'll print it out so it's you know sort of permanent and you know it kind of goes against you at times because um i should be putting more content out uh, and people ask me when are you going to put something new up and you know why don't you sing this cover and why don't you do this on youtube and i kind of go oh, yeah well you know i, I might do it tomorrow it depends how I feel and how I look and how I my voice feels to me and how you know it did. so I you know a lot of people just go bang 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 and they put anything out you know here's me here's me I've just you know I'm in the garden and I'm going to sing this song for you you know um or pick up the guitar and just play something prompt you just to just to upload something I I, I can't do that yeah it, it has to be quality and it has to it has to mean something it's not you know, uh, so yeah, so I should post more, but um, yeah, I, I will get around to, to that for sure. But um, but yeah, in answer to your question, uh, yeah, I, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to be organised, and everything is is uh, there where you want it, when you want it, and the right road case for it, and the <laughs> you know the right you know, and I'm just yeah, tidy person, I guess. But yeah, I've always been like that. I know I keep you with me. Before we get to Maggie May, tell me about getting involved with Sing It Live and when you met Darren and things like that. Yeah, well, I've known Darren for many, many years, way before Pine Street Country Club and all that sort of stuff. So, And he's helped me out on a certain bits and pieces, you know, during my career. Um, when he went solo, I guess, with Sing It Live, um, he started contacting people 
vocalist that you know he thought might be interested and I was on that list and um it's funny because I was on tour at the time I was doing something I can't remember and I get a phone call from Darren and I'm and I'm you know what it's like when you're you sound checked and you 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 got 10 minutes to have a shower and get ready for the gig. And I'm and like Darren's on the phone, oh, come on, man, you're gonna do this. And I'm like, I don't know, man, what are you talking about? What what's what's sing it live, you know? Um, so I kind of brushed it off at first. I thought, yeah, look, don't have time for this, you know. But then when I realized um, you know, the quality of of vocalists and musicians that are participating in this, like yourself, I thought, man, I've got to be involved. This is great, you know. And um, that's how it came about. Yeah. So he basically hounded me for a few weeks and um, yeah, finally I got involved. Nice. So we did Rosanna first, I think. Was that right? Yes. What else was there? There was that's Cold as Ice. That's right. Foreigner? Yeah. That was very early days. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Goo Goo Dolls song as well. Iris. Yeah. yeah. I love that song. That's one of my favorites. Um, I really enjoyed doing that one. Plus I've got to play guitar. Mm. Um, but yeah, Rosanna was the first one to crack a million views on YouTube. So that was, that was good. Mm. Um, yeah, it's always fun playing with you. It's, it was, it's, you know, the five years I think we spent in that band you, you referred to was, was, was awesome. I mean, when you're on stage, you know, you come alive, you're this eccentric character, which brings such a lift to the band and, and with my kind of front man kind of things as well, we kind of blended we did quite, you know, it was it was a, a great team, you know. Um, yeah, yeah so it's fun. It's always fun playing with you, mate. Yeah, yeah, likewise. Because I, I, I was going to say that you sort of helped bring that out of me. You've always got that sort of endearing quality to be on stage next to because, you know, I might be like thinking about like, uh, <laughs> oh, my guitar pickup setting or whatever it is. And then I'll look over at you and you're kind of going off and sort of like you've got that way of uh, like being inclusive. So it was just easy then, you know, to just be able to have that, you know, right kind of energy for the particular music we were doing was quite rocky and so forth. And um, a lot of the songs that you've been involved with and and I on Sing It Live are usually quite energetic. But I guess that's the beauty about Sing It Live is that it's not always, you know, the same thing. It's quite varied. Yeah, he's got a really good diverse uh, bunch of musos there, I think. Maggie May was um, probably one of the most challenging songs I've ever sung, and I've sung a lot of covers. Rod Stewart is deceivingly <laughs> very, very difficult. I'm a belter, as you probably know, you know, and when I get in the zone and I get that high palate belt thing, nothing could stop me. I, you know, I can just get pretty much any note. But with Maggie May, because Rod Stewart has that naturally high voice, it's kind of, you know, the Rusky, you know, I can't even do it. You know, I'd have to do it in falsetto, but um, he has that natural tone. You can't emulate it. You can't copy it. Mm. And um, that's why I think um, there's not that many Rod Stewart tribute bands. I mean, there's a million tribute bands. There's a million Bon Jovi tribute bands. Um, but uh, Rod Stewart is, is one of those really, you know, because you kind of either have to belt it to get the high notes yeah, or you kind of have to go back and, and almost in a falsetto kind of a voice. So I, I look, I did, I did it my way. Hopefully, people like it, you know. So I blended a little bit of both, but you know, it, yeah, it, it was it was a difficult one to do. With Sing It Live, we don't necessarily always try and do, you know, a carbon copy, do we? We we sort of do our own version, even though we are trying our best to be able to do a tribute to the fantastic original yep. that it is. But um, I guess one of the things that I've noticed by doing this over and over is that I'm not Eddie Van Halen, sadly. I'm not Steve Lukather. I'm not whoever it is if I'm playing guitar. I mean, yep. I even played drums recently. And so I guess all I can do is I can only do my best version of of me and and try and you know stand tall knowing that well I did my best for me and so as you say hopefully people will like it because I guess sadly people sometimes do have this expectation of like oh well like you gave it a good shot but it just wasn't the same and so I'm realizing more and more as time goes on it's like well it's never going to be the same yeah, the comments are interesting, aren't they? <laughs> uh, 
I mean, most of the comments are lovely, you know, um, but you're always going to get the, um, oh, that sounds nothing like Steve Perry. How dare you? You know, <laughs> of course it doesn't. Yeah. You know, um, I'm singing it. It's, 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 everyone has a different tone and you can't, you know, copy someone perfectly. And I don't want to cop, you know, the only, the only time I'll want to copy someone is when I'm doing a tribute show. Mm. Um, but yeah, sing it live. You got to, it's, it's, and I keep saying to these people, you know, when I answer, look, it's my interpretation. Yeah. It's our interpretation of the song. And hopefully we do it justice. And, and I think most of the time we do, but true fans really want it to sound exactly the same. Um, but yeah, it's our interpretation, you know. Morning sun, when it's in your face, when it shows your rage. But that don't worry me, no, in my eyes or everything. So performing live versus performing in the studio, what are the yes. biggest sort of obvious differences for you? Oh, you know what? You either love I hate the studio and I am one of these guys who hates the studio. Even sing it live, I find quite challenging because when you're live, we're doing a gig, you've got that adrenaline, you've got the crowd. I, I, I bounce off people. I'm that kind of performer. I need that feedback and that, that from the crowd and, and my bandmates. Yeah, that's why we work together so well on stage. When you're, we'll start with sing it live, you know, it's kind of, it's normally in a morning afternoon thing. It's a great little room. I love his studio, but it's still kind of, okay, let's go. Let's get in there. You know, and as you know, you get you only get a couple goes at it, you know. And if you're not on, that's it. it. It is what it is. As a vocalist, I have my good and bad days, you know. I don't think people realise how um, hard it is to, to keep up, you know, consistent uh, vocals um, with your surroundings and all that sort of thing. So, I mean, for example, you know, I might wake up one day, and have um, I would have had a bit of reflux during the night or something, and my voice is just not ready to sing till probably till two or three p.m. when it's kind of warmed up and it's gone and it's cleared up and it's ready to go. Um, whereas you know, drums, guitarists, you know, they can get in the studio at eight a.m. and you know, <laughs> and whack out a solo, and you know, whereas vocal vocalists, it really depends on how you're feeling physically on. Um, how you look after yourself, the environment, um, you know, if it's humid in, you know, where you're singing, it really affects everything. If it's dry. So yeah, I find, I find singing at life quite, quite challenging. Cause yeah, you got to go in there and you just got to do it. And yeah, with the studio stuff as well, I don't mind the studio. I've got a little studio set up and you can see it, you know, mics and stuff. And I really enjoy um, recording stuff here in my own time because, you know, I can just do it when I feel right, you know. Uh, if it's not right, I'll come do it again tomorrow and make it better and um, take my time. But, yeah, when you go in the studio, it's very sterile as well and it's very, you know, get the job done, especially if a record pay, uh, company is paying for it. I've done sessions in 301 in Sydney and, and you know, ACDC's recording studio, Albert's. I've done some stuff there. And, you know, when when publishing companies are paying for your time, it's you can't muck around. It's like get in that vocal booth and sing this song now. I'm his money. Yeah, yeah. Whereas at home, I do it in my own time and I love it. I love it. So yeah. But yeah, definitely a live person. Yeah. I love it. You know, because you got the crowd, you got you know, you got a couple of songs to warm up. Yeah. You know, and then you hit your your zone, you know, probably about, you know quarter halfway into the gig you just you're warmed up and you feel good and yeah so uh, definitely a live live person yeah so speaking of live you've got you can see right behind uh, a bon jovi tribute band tell us about that yeah look it's called one wild night like i said there are a lot of bon jovi tribute bands around australia i think ours uh, you know it's been years in the making of the right guys you know exactly the right guys in the band that suit the music and suit the playing and um growing up i guess i've always had a kind of vocal and physical resemblance to john and people have been saying you know you need to do this you, need, you, should, you should do it bon jovi guy. and i was a big fan of the music so it about five, six, seven years ago, it finally eventuated. We don't play every week because it's not one of those, you know, corner pub bands. It's kind of, we do special occasions and uh, festivals and bigger shows, 
yeah, fringe. We just did a fringe show. So yeah, yeah, that's that's just a bit of fun, a little bit of a side thing. Um, that's always always a bit of fun. Yeah. So what's in store for Tib in the near future musically? Um, do, do you have any um, ideas for some more Sing It Live songs that you would like to do in future? Or do you have um, you know uh, some live things coming up at all? I have a couple of gigs coming up interstate. Um, I think there's a couple in Sydney, I think, um, coming up shortly. So I've, I'm, I'm kind of in the process of learning songs that I've never sung before, which is... Um, you know, you know what that's like because you you've you, you need you know you know doing quite a lot of sing it live. You've got to be like, <laughs> as you said in your past videos, today I'm learning this song and I've only got one hour to do it. You know, so once again, as a vocalist, lyrics are a hard hard thing because these particular songs that I'm doing, there's a lot of lyrics in the songs. <laughs> it's I think it's a Black Sabbath, Pink Floyd, uh, Deep Purple kind of night. Yeah. And cool. it's, from around the country or something doing it and um some of those 70s rock songs they've got about a million verses <laughs> and it's like it's like i really don't want to use cheat sheets you know the little notes but sometimes you just have to um so i've got a few of those kind of gigs coming up so i'm, I'm desperately trying to uh learn listen to lyrics and learn learn them which is hard you have a, a conscious process for learning lyrics yes um that's a good question i heard you talk about that in your previous some of your previous some um, videos um there's always the played in the car a million times obviously you've got to keep listening keep listening keep it but then after a while i find that sort of goes over your head a bit yeah you find that i do there's definitely a point where like that's not working anymore it's yeah. kind of a waste of time you got to do whatever the next step is and for me, my conscious process is like if it's guitar that I have to just, I have to start writing stuff down, like just little notes just to yeah. not necessarily so that I have to always read from it. But for instance, you know, knowing the song structure is a big thing for me because if I know all of the ingredients, but don't know the order of which yeah. that they are, I, I, I feel like I'm quite lost. Yeah. Uh, you know what a, a really bizarre thing that really helps me is reading the Wikipedia, nerding about when it was recorded, where it was yeah. recorded, who wrote it. Doesn't help learning the song at all, but does it? Because <laughs> if you are connected to it more, then all of a sudden you have a stronger connection to it. So, I mean, oh, things like that. Yeah, helps. I totally agree. Actually, you know what I've, I've discovered now and what I'm doing now to some really important songs that I have to learn, like Sing Alive, um, I record them. Yeah, I, I, I set up my little mic in my studio, and I actually record the song as if I'm going to release it. Yeah, and that way, because you've got to do it, you know, you keep doing it. You know, next verse, next verse, next verse. It sort of gets stuck in your head, and you you remember things more. And then yeah, yeah, you can also listen back. So with um Maggie May, I actually recorded it, and then I had to listen back, and you know, and, and just to hear whether what I'm doing is is going to be, you know representative of the song so yeah that's my little method now I, I i try and record the song <laughs> that's a really good one i did that for uh don't you forget about me this simple mind yes. i didn't have much time but i decided to spend some time doing that and then that gave me a little bit of feedback of oh well, I'm a bit flat on that note and 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 not quite yes exactly the right yeah. melody there and yeah. Because yeah. in that particular one, there was a really interesting melody where it's not actually um, a, a major scale, it's a mixolydian. And I don't know how well I would have latched onto that in, in such a short space of time if I didn't do that. So, yeah, so recording, good one. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's um, it disciplines you with the song, like, you know, and because I go, you know, you have to go back and listen to the original. What did he do there? What did he do there? And yeah, because Rod's Rod's melodies are really interesting as well. It's um, you know, you until you try to sing it, you don't realize how complex some of his melodies are. Because some of them he'd be going, you know, make a living out of playing school. 
Yeah. And then the next line would be make a living out of playing pool. Yeah, it's it's kind of is he gonna go up? Is he gonna stay on the note? Is he gonna what, what's what's the next verse? What's he doing? You know, yeah. before you listen to it on the radio, it's like it's, you know, it's all the same, it's fine, but it's not all the same. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Learnings, you know. So it's a good way to be able to chip away at it, isn't it? And I guess with a guy like Rod Stewart, then if you listen to the live version from 1976 versus the live version from 1994 yeah. versus the live version from 2019, he's not necessarily going to be doing it exactly the same either. So that can potentially be, uh-oh, information overload, or it can give you that like, oh, that's a good little thing. And, and you feel like, well, if the great man himself did it, well, yeah. surely that gives me license to. <laughs> Problem with that is people don't buy it. They're like, no, that's wrong. That's not the that's not the album version. But you go, hang on, but he did it live like that. It's the same with Bon Jovi. They um they change stuff up, well, especially now, but but back in the day, even um, you know, he would sing stuff differently live. You know, so um yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one. Buy myself a rock and roll bed. So just before we get out of here, mate, the first thing that pops into your head, greatest ever moment as a musician, and then also maybe the worst, worst one, but maybe hopefully that the worst ones are really good learning. Oh, just some of those cover gigs, you know, like um, we were just talking about the other day, we were setting up for this disastrous gig and this old man walks into our trailer and smashes his head open and... Um, the gig was just terrible and the crowd hated, you know, just weren't getting into it. And then the the um the owner comes up and says, oh, you know, next time, you know, play this and play that. And you just feel so demoralized, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, look, there's a lot of, yeah, there's many, many bad moments, obviously. Um, but best moment, geez, I don't know. Um, we supported a lot of great bands when in that Lost Angels band we were talking about, you know, like greats like Ian Gillen and, and you know, a lot of international kind of bands. Um, so probably just, yeah, just being in that environment, you know, when you, you're playing a big, a big original gig, you're playing your own music and people are loving it, you know. I think that's probably would have been my best moment. Which is what well, I'm actually writing with a friend of mine from Sydney called Jeremy Barnes, and we're actually writing a, a rock album. Yeah, cool. Um, so with a bunch of really great musos, and yeah, that's slowly coming together as well. So uh, hopefully, I'll have some original stuff out very soon. No worries. I will leave a link below so that if anybody's wanting to follow you, they can do so. Subscribe. <laughs> yeah yeah on your youtube channel right yeah, yeah. so uh so yeah so please follow tib and um say hi to him from me <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much crafty yeah no worries well thanks always for your time today mate always a pleasure we could sit here and chat yeah. all day but uh, as you said fringe season it's yes. uh, it's still fringe season yeah. in adelaide i've got to get moving and go nuts so i hope you enjoyed watching this video and if you haven't already done so subscribe to sing it live and also as tib generously mentioned the crafting music tips has a bunch of other behind yes. the sounds videos also a bunch of other just general music tips here on the crafting music tips youtube channel i hope that they can be of help for you so um tib i'll see you soon and uh, you watching i'll see you soon as well rock Thanks. on was a pleasure. Rock on, buddy.